How are we all doing? Having fun? Long day? Long week? So it's been brought to my attention that I am the one thing between you and food. So I say, fasten your seat belts. My name is Michael Dexter, and I bring you Michael Dexter's Life of Beehive. It's a long journey, a valiant journey, and it began here at Meet BSD. 2010, at Hacker Do Dojo, just south of here, IX Systems once again held a very fine event, absolutely true unconference format beginning to end, which was certainly productive, useful, fun. And we broke the unconference rules and all got in one giant session in a big circle and discussed virtualization. Naturally, as been touched on many times today, there is a strong history of jails on FreeBSD. And that's maybe not reached its full potential, but there's still continuing potential in development and great opportunities there in this age of containing things and dockerizing and whatever one does. But the conclusion from that meeting, which actually took place over the two days, a small, smaller meeting took place upstairs the next day among several vendors, was that we need a hypervisor. There were, all, there were certainly some options out there, but none had really reached any level of maturity like we see today. This was before the po popularity and usability of, say, KVM on Linux. Zen was very popular at the time in very specific niches. Over with the NetBSD folks, they did have Zen. And NetBSD was a very early Zen platform as both a host and a guest. And it came out of the 32-bit era. It came out of the fully para-virtualized era where you emulated, had special drivers for the OS to speak to the hypervisor. And it uh, could not run on modified guests. It treated me very well. I set that up in around 2008. It never hiccuped. It worked great. And for those who are maybe not familiar with hypervisors to any degree, maybe show of hands, how deep do I have to go? OK, it sounds like there's some general broad knowledge. Uh, to make a long story short, it makes one system behave like many systems in various ways. And. In many regards, NetBSD and Zen is a best kept secret. I believe it will run Windows, but I'm not sure if anyone's tried that. And that could be a killer app that could make some people some money. But they're a quiet bunch. I love them dearly. And again, it never hiccuped on me. There's also OpenBSD, who's getting in the hypervisor business. Um, I don't know what's going on here back in 07 in, in Italy. Uh, they're also known as the nice who say ni. <laughs> Let it sink in. <laughs> so, pardon? <laughs> and so, this is all five years before they announced their hypervisor, VMM. So, back in 2010, uh, it was a, a pretty uh, empty data set for hypervisors available with the proper licensing, the proper simplicity that often brings things like security, and they've certainly latched on to the simplicity needed for what they consider their security approach. And fast forwarding, we see things like floppy bugs in QEMU affecting Zen and KVM. So there, there, there are advantages to many different approaches and many different hypervisors. So. Since that original Meet BSD 2010, where this was discussed a year later, which is pretty darn quick, Beehive popped out into the community. And I profoundly thank those who made that happen. It was at BSD Can with our Mounties and the like. And uh, that was historic news, but it was very, very quiet for a while. Uh, engineers are quiet by nature. They have the needs they bring to the table by nature. They meet those needs by nature, and 
If you're either not that developer or not with those same needs or not in touch with that developer, you may never hear of the technology. So from day one in 2011, we had a permissively licensed, unencumbered, which should, oh, unencumbered insofar as when things come from vendors, they often have strings attached like trademarks, like patents, like marketing teams, or complete lack of marketing teams, or lots of developers, or no developers. And fortunately, looking back, I think Beehive came with just the right amount of attachment, be it uh, between two and three active developers who could contribute some time within that organization. And no patents to worry about, to my knowledge, no baggage that a great many other projects can have to face when something comes over the wall from a, a vendor. It was emulation free. This, unlike Zen, which I mentioned, which came out of an era where on 32-bit hardware, you would do things like special drivers that interfaced with a hypervisor to make the guest do anything useful. This came in an era where hardware acceleration in the form of extended page tables and AMD's marketing term per week for the week applied and allowed for a CPU to provide in CPU hardware acceleration that uh, provided a speed up that was unseen on, say, Zen in those good early days and anyone who's emulating, say, QEMU and friends and Box and GXEMUL and all those friends. And that made for a tremendous level of simplicity. The actual code in total with all its utilities was under, what, 500K? Uh, the, kernel, uh, the kernel module helped the OS do the heavy lifting through the CPU and it's, I don't know, 20K in size, 30K. That was quite cool. It was an amazing parlor trick. It ran FreeBSD extremely well. Uh, FreeBSD is quite remarkable in that it boots just about anywhere. It doesn't care if over NFS, over a block device, over a Zvol, over all sorts of wonderful things, over the network. And in this case, uh, the lowest hanging fruit was to take the, the, the default bootloader, put it in user space, aim it at a kernel, and fire it off. And uh, that meant for both quick development, in that one year time, for a basic, a really cool basic uh, solution, and continued development upon that. So moving forward, come BSD 2012, we had actual users. Uh, if by some accounts I'm user zero on the outside world, I think enterprise user zero is in front row, Alan Jude here, who is like, well, wait a minute, Alan has a, a full free BSD infrastructure around the world with the occasional unicorn running something like CentOS, running a, one piece of software that needs that OS and has to do one function. So if one has a workflow that's a, hopefully unified, it's like, get the damn unicorn out, please. So what Alan found was that for an encoding piece of software, as I recall, uh, would work very well in CentOS, as I recall, on Beehive, on his existing infrastructure. Now, Encoding is very CPU intensive as opposed to necessarily network or disk intensive. And the results were, Alan? 100%. 100%. He just set it up and forgot about it and moved on to the next challenge. So that was pretty significant in that the outside world was benefiting from a piece of software that someone is willing to go to a bit of trouble to set up and, and, and maintain but which did the job. That's, that's cool. It wasn't a, 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 you know, a rough experience. So I think at that point we hit the, the 2080 point where for most of the people in this room, it probably did 20% of what you need it to do. And there's this whole exciting 80% that requires a whole lot more work. And, and wow, it's easy to get always inspired and upset about that. I mean, look at her, she's like, like, no windows, seriously? She's got this look over there like, gah. Anyway, so a lot of hard work followed that. And by, by, by achieving usability, it started attracting other FreeBSD developers, other people experimenting, 
outside of the original small little team of crazy people who are willing to try something so experimental. John Baldwin, you still in the room? Probably hiding in front. Things like 32-bit guest support just showed up thanks to wonderful people like John. I was like, whoa, really? You're, oh, sweet. And that's actually a, if you've ever been involved with a project of the, of this sort of new nature where it's a new category of sorts, you will typically be the last person on the planet to find out about some cool new thing coming down the pipe from somewhere. So <laughs> to be close to the project is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily make you an expert in its community because, well, people also by nature as developers are pretty quiet about such things. And more hard work, and more hard work, and finally, a release in FreeBSD 10.0 on January 14th. I will never forget it. Uh, it's, it can be a very long journey to take a really cool parlor trick and get it into something that gets shipped out to a whole lot of people. There were some tiny regressions or a few niceties that didn't make it, but for the most part, it was a very useful, reliable piece of software that hit FreeBSD 10. Now, I've certainly been personally testing it in various ways, trying to break it over the years. But I think my one primary contribution was to get it in, to help get it into 10 rather than 11 or 12. But beyond that, all the heavy lifting has been by brilliant engineers around the world. And by that point, the 32-bit support I mentioned earlier, AMD support, which was one of those things, well, where is that? You know, that woman in the back there looking like, where's my AMD support? It's like, well, but we can do so many great things. So we have Linux, we have OpenBSD, we have NetBSD, but where's my AMD support? Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. UEFI support came not immediately after that, but since then. Uh, various emulation, be it network devices, be it storage devices. Now, that's not necessarily the most performant way to do it. It's kind of a flashback to the Zen days where you have little shims, if you will, that make like disks show up. Well, that's really convenient for deploying a new operating system from which once it's up and running, you can add the vert IO drivers that make all that stuff work pretty elegantly and simply. So among all that, as I mentioned, lots of operating systems are supported. FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, GNU Linux, Smart OS, and Windows. So that woman looking, skulls looking at us can finally be satisfied on that one. Now, ah, Smart OS gets very interesting with things like the ZFS test suite. ZFS on ZFS, but on another ZFS platform. So that is exciting. There are rumors it will run Oracle Solaris. I haven't seen that firsthand. Uh, there are various experiments on Mac OS, but officially there's no legal path to do that. So uses since then. Mind you, I'm the last person to hear about really cool uses out in the community. Depenguinization, that's what Alan was doing early on. Get that unicorn out of the homogenous network. I couldn't find a very good image for a penguin, but sure, I think that did it. Ah, boot after install. Things can explode when you take your trusty, let's say, FreeBSD 9 something system to something exciting like 12 head. And I touched on this in the Dev Summit. For those who caught that, I'll elaborate. So. Raise your hand if you've installed FreeBSD. I know not everyone here is a FreeBSD user, and that's awesome. We, we welcome you here. That's very, very cool. Alan, you've never, come on. So it's a pretty straightforward install, and fortunately, it is FreeBSD on top of FreeBSD. So the installer is largely what you end up with on disk, and what you have on disk is largely what's in the installer. It plays a few little tricks to make it convenient to do that, but it, it's FreeBSD. And I, I, just a week or two ago, I thought, well, wait a minute. OK, well, let, let's load the, the kernel module for the hypervisor. There's an example of a, a simple VM management script. I just installed my OS to ADA0, the primary hard drive. Uh, let's, let's try this. And I was very, very pleasantly surprised that suddenly I booted the OS I had just installed prior to rebooting the hardware. So if that was a new bleeding edge exciting version of FreeBSD 12 head, you could do that on an older version that you, well, I guess the installer would be that probably newer version, but 
it worked. And it's, it's, there's no added component, there's no package, there's no purchase software. This is all in base. And the, the, the more you step back and look at an operating system with a base, the more you realize, wow, there's a lot here. And a lot can be done in that, like scripted installs to virtual machines using the same installer because it's the same darn software on the same darn software. And a deployed system has the installer. It doesn't have the distribution set, but we'll get to that. Ah, uh, bootloader development. Alan, <laughs> we have Alan again to thank. Uh, so FreeBSD has supported ZFS, or in his case, ZFS for a, a long time. It was arguably a killer app. But funny, the, the loader, or first the installer, and then the loader didn't support either any ZFS or nifty features like boot environments, which allow you to sit down and boot, say, FreeBSD 10, 11, 12, effortlessly, all from the same underlying storage pool. So Alan found that, well, if I'm going to be blowing something up blind, such as working on a loader where at best you'll have a little print, extra print statement that lets something fly by and at least show you where you are at the code. That's really handy under a hypervisor. In user space and you get to sit back listening to your tunes in another window and then doing this in a nice safe environment rather than sitting like all the, I pity you, I'm so sorry, all the embedded developers who have spent hours or years of their lives watching some serial download take place that will hopefully boot and kick back and give you serial output and all that nonsense. Well, this makes that very easy. And the student kernel. This is what I mentioned at the Dev Summit. Uh, inspired by Alan's work in a little in situs uh, environment, FreeBSD does have a minimal kernel. It's called minimal, and I thought, sweet, that's exactly what we want for a hypervisor. It's very container-like, very, what's that other buzzword? Uh, rump kernel-like, very minimalistic. And then I'm like, wait, there's a Zen driver in there? That, that's not minimalistic. That's like a Netflix kernel thrown in there. OK, fine. So one afternoon, I sat and thought, OK, what? is the true minimal kernel to get something booting. So I took the kernel conf, commented everything out, and just started stepping through it. And I found that, well, you name the thing. Uh, we don't want to build all the modules, but there are a few that we want, so we override them. We do enough to do ZFS. We do a few to satisfy some complaints. And we do vert IO so we can do in Beehive virtual networking, or virtual IOs, vert IO networking, and storage. So I found that from the top, you do need to choose a scheduler in the standard configuration file has a choice. I guess we need some uh, PCI support because there might be a little bug that lets some MSI interrupts leak. And uh, the loopback device, according to my, my colleagues, is an ancient dependency that's been there forever. And it needs loop even if you don't, from a user's perspective, use loopback in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I found that Ethernet was required to build, or Ether. The UART, so you can actually see what you're doing, a local APIC related to that. And at this point, I found I could boot the kernel to mount root. If you look at the generic kernel, you will see some things that say, do not comment this out. That was probably true 10 years ago, or 15, or at some point. And I don't care which point, because this worked. So moving on, we would like to talk to a storage device. So well, let's throw in a few things related to one another for storage devices. In this case, uh, DA, I think, was because I was aiming at a particular type of device. More console-related things, so it's prettier to look at. Uh, I believe the random device was used for storage, and we want GM partitioning so we can actually do something with our storage. So moving on, uh, added vert IO devices, uh, the, uh, modules, and then not unlike booting from the installer, Beehive load, we go to the uh, boot directory that contains a kernel in user space, give it a memory allocation and a name and a few things about the storage where we'll get the rest of the OS. But if you just want to boot the kernel for something like the loader work, you don't need space and the rest of the OS. It just works. And it's all with a few lines of text that will fit on parchment in a presentation. Let me get these microphones back. So. Your cool tricks here. I've been polling people this last few days on 
Neat similar tricks. Do you have any to share that the others might benefit from? Anyone, anyone? Peter? <laughs> Alan? <laughs> others? Um, it takes creativity within a nice environment with so many resources available to you. Because if you come from an environment that has, let's just say hard-coded abilities across the board, your creativity may as well be left at home, but I'm finding it quite flexible. I was hoping to start this talk playing a video game, fragging, and all that, but I'll, I'll touch on the media point right now. So, there's, I'll, I'll just say it, yes, I know there are some people who promise to be here with pitchforks about the ability to pass a graphics card through to a virtual machine, play their games on that on a, sem a separate monitor with FreeBSD running under the hood, letting you do other things like playing with bootloaders. That's not here yet, however, something very similar is here. One can pass through a GPU, a graphics chip, for many cool things, such as uh, RDP acceleration, that's the remote desktops for Windows, that works remarkably well, and the little phone apps are amazing just to connect across to a machine. It's fast, it's efficient, it's pretty. And similarly, any kind of number crunching for, say, uh, the encoding, like Alan was doing, as I mentioned early on. Also related to that would be uh, virtual desktops. They can benefit from that acceleration where the server is doing some heavy lifting and the bare minimum of data needed for the user is passed over to a client and that's handled. And someone pointed out, I hope Jordan you're listening, uh, well if you've got like a Myth TV or a Plex box and it's constantly doing some form of, of re-encoding of data for your phone, of movies for your phone or some kind of media to, to just handle different things and it indexes it and does all these pretty things. Your NAS box may want to have a GPU to accelerate all that because your average NAS doesn't have a whole lot of CPU power because you don't need a lot of CPU power. But when you start doing media server type applications, uh, that might be useful and might be very useful to some sectors. So, speaking of features, in the works, USB pass-through. Uh, I won't give any time dates on anything because life <coughs> impacts everyone involved at all times, but uh, as, as I, who attended the earlier little unconferency bit? So a great many users have that same unicorn. For example, if they're making the money on FreeBSD as Alan does with Scale Engine or, and counting it on Windows with some app, often that Windows app has some little dongle that needs to be used to do the licensing for the, the bookkeeping app, which is like not our problem, but still that's very useful to users. So uh, that and those who are trying to escape, say, all these corporate chat tools and video conferencing tools and you name it with a hangout and a thing, well, USB video support would be very useful and uh, just pass it into the VM that has whatever latest terrifying version of Flash and Silverlight and you name it. Uh, that's definitely mapped out in, in the works. Sound emulation is in the works for similar reasons and for perhaps those game players and other things. Not super complicated, uh, there are some challenges, but uh, give them an inch, they want a, a yard, and okay, fine. Uh, there's always something more that someone wants. Uh, currently, Beehive needs to be operated as root. There's a, a plan to have that work as, say, un, an unprivileged user. There's been at least one or two GSOC projects relating to ARM support, and I've, I heard lots of RISC-V come up, but that one's definitely interesting, and we've seen now, like, consumer products with 64-bit chips and virtualization hardware acceleration. That's exciting, so there's work to be done. Please jump in, please let me know what resources are available to you, both human, financial, you name it, whatever. Uh, Having started out with an extremely distinct use case and then all these nifty demands being piled on top of it, there is room for co code modularity such that one can add some of these features without uh, upsetting others or having to detangle and you, you name it. And of course, one killer app feature, live migration. 
related to suspend and resume because in a synthetic environment saying, okay, here's my, my resources, uh, if you can say keep those somewhat generic, it greatly simplifies that process compared to say a few hundred top laptop manufacturers and their models and little differences. So that's certainly something of interest and certainly mapped out to various degrees. I'm quite pleased with how the uh, FreeNAS 10 team is exploring the 9P uh, Plan 9 file system in which you can do things like pass rather than a block device to a virtual machine, a directory to a virtual machine. And they have the server running and they have a client running for Linux such that Linux can sit in a directory and you can aim the hypervisor at it. I had an article a few months ago about something like that where I took a boot environment, which is again choosing different OSs at boot time, sharing it over NFS and firing the hypervisor at that. It's a bit of a clumsy process. It could be streamlined, but that's cool. Install the OS. Here's our new version. Throw a test suite at it, booting its real kernel and software, and then consider rebooting hardware. Moving on. Uh, probably of the features, uh, one of the most actively pursued one is persistent UEFI variables. The UEFI stack from Intel to Anocare Core allows for all the nifty Windows graphical setup, which means in practice you load up into like a, like a modern BIOS on, say, a laptop, and then you can, in this case, export that to a VNC connection so you can connect and see something, which is very useful rather than running blind, which was how that was originally done. But persistent storage is pretty much the same as jumping into BIOS and telling, hey, this is my boot device. I want to always boot to that rather than a shot in the dark and other useful things. Some OSs handle the lack of this well. Some absolutely do not, and that's life right now. Oh, in that same VNC environment, there is a set of safe resolutions and then chaos. If you don't follow those rules, that will become arbitrary and you can make mistakes or have a really sk several skinny little, little VGA displays like you do with your little consoles, watching several systems. Uh, there's some, some, some harmony that can happen with the, the UEFI code. There are two different versions right now for different purposes. One graphics, one not, one more legacy. Uh, as is becoming quite hot, it turns out, these little Intel boards and compute sticks and all that have a, a, a funny mix <laughs> of 32-bit UEFI and 64-bit UEFI and processing. And so uh, supporting that properly should not be too difficult. And then again, uh, Devin's talk touched on the improved uh, uh, VNet and other friends. And I think out of that comes NetMap and a better NE2000 driver. So again, you can drop it on an OS and have a network device from which you can do other things. And touching on FreeNAS 10, this is a very obscure joke for someone who has left the project, but I hope in your hearts some of you get that. <laughs> It is for all of those people saying, hey, where's my Proxmox VMware Fusion equivalent so I can effortlessly click next, 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 finish. FreeNAS 10 itself will have a beautiful interface that's uh, hopefully not requiring a 300 page manual. That's been a goal early on. And in that virtualization, choose a pre-installed pre OS, set, give it some RAM, tell how many cores, a few storage requirements, share it over VSC, uh, VNC and bang, off you go. And then even pop into another browser window with that terminal output or VNC output, you name it. So that's rather exciting stuff and someone had to do it. That wasn't me. There were various, I think there have been startups that have tried to do that, but still here and now, if you want to dabble with Beehive just in the easiest, cleanest environment, give that a try. How to help. Wow, so early on when there was strictly the low level, I don't know if it's an orange book Intel CPU guide describing all the little bits that need to jump around to make all the hardware assistance work, there was a very few list of people on the planet who could do that kind of work. And they're nice people, they're in various companies and they're some in the community, but that was really gnarly work and jumping into help would be a very complex, uh, 
challenge, but as all those features start adding on, we've seen a lot more opportunities for people to hop in and add components. And uh, one perennial challenge has been all these stupid OS-specific requirements. So if there are any GNU Linux project leaders in the world, step one, stop renaming and date stamping and all this nonsense in just the grub config file. <laughs> one location would be amazing. It would be fantastic so that when we aim something like a hypervisor at it, we know where to look. Similarly, I have spent way too many times trying to make sense of download mirrors where um, I think Gentoo was the culprit who had a very long name ISO with zero indication of what OS it was. Don't do that, please. That just complicates this. And I would love to try your OS under Beehive, but that has to be easy. But making it easy applies to everything and all this software. So show of hands, who considers yourself a developer, relatively low level, see and friends? Quarter of the room, perhaps? And let's say uh, higher up the stack, uh, Python shell and friends developers? Quarter of the room? I'd hope the first category also fits in the other category. And strictly end users? We have one end user, <laughs> we have two, <laughs> and one's a core team member. Okay, thank you. So talk to myself, talk to other people involved with the project. Uh, I've gotten some fantastic questions today. Where do I read more? Start with the man page. This is in base. It is there. Man Beehive is a really great place to start. Uh, there, uh, there's a pretty good handbook chapter that Alan set up, and hopefully we'll get some love from perhaps myself. And Helping out takes all forms. Yes, sir? The handbook chapter doesn't contain those instructions for Windows. The handbook chapter could use uh, some updating for Windows, but the wiki's a lot more updated. And there are some various blog posts out there of, of, of pretty good value. Uh, thank you, Sato-san. It looks like there will be a, would this be fourth BeehiveCon in Tokyo? Just uh, during the Dev Summit prior to Asia BSD Con, for three years, years in a row, there has been Beehive Con, an event uh, with maybe 50 to 100 people that's just had some wonderful input and a lot of participation from non FreeBSD hypervisor folks. Now, most notably, the OpenBSD folks. So I'm, I'm happy to get that out there. I would love to see more cooperation between the projects. There have been many olive branches offered over the years, and such is life. Uh, money hasn't been an issue. Of course, having like a sponsor for the bento lunches on just BeehiveCon is useful, but the project itself has been embraced by so many vendors. It's, it's actually been quite beneficial. I've seen the same with, say, the OpenZFS project. The vendors have behaved quite well and put on fantastic events and said, here are some fixed costs, let's address those and let's not talk big old slush funds and such because it hasn't been needed and there's not been a question of uh, let's hire a core developer for this extremely narrow niche that only a few people are qualified for because they're often hired at the moment. If any of those people are looking for work, great, let's discuss those opportunities, but I haven't seen them yet. Another way to help is to not pass away. We all profoundly miss Benjamin, who was here at the last Meet BSD, and it was a pretty hard punch to the project when he passed away uh, just a year or two ago. And yeah, uh, we miss you dearly. He was doing the most significant enterprise testing out there that really pushed uh, the new UFI work to its limits. Yes, sir. Well, this guy's right there <laughs> in front of you. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Benjamin. And so, thank you. I am easy to find, Michael Dexter on Twitter. Uh, as of yesterday, Dexter at freebsd.org. And, <laughs> I sat on the fence for a very long time, I admit. I had to just see if certain criteria be met by the project, and thank you, Benedict, for being my mentor. I appreciate that. And 
how are we on time? Because there might be a, a moment for some, not only Q&A, but unconference format. We have about 20 minutes, although I know everyone's hungry or thirsty or both. <laughs> and I respect that, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Any questions? Impossible, come on. <laughs> Any feature requests beyond the gaming? I know, I, I, we know, we know. So we all, the whole team knows. <laughs> Other feature requests. Vax. Vax support, yes, Corey's, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, what are you using now? Show of hands for, say, VMware. One, two. Okay. Zen server. Okay. Zen server is off the beaten path, but people are very, very happy with it. Share it over NFS. Aim your free NAS at it. Zen server. It's it's a really good solution, believe it or not. Uh, KVM on just about anything. Show of hands, a few there, cool. Uh, Proxmox, which is KVM all packaged up and apparently with ZFS, kind of cool. Okay, we've got a few users. ZFS on Linux. ZFS on Linux, which you have to be prefaced, fine. Hyper-V, I know we have a representative here and they'd love to see lots of support. Uh, anyone doing a combination of FreeBSD on Hyper-V and other things on Hyper-V? Because that's a hot topic. Corey's, you've tried everything. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Um, what hypervisors am I missing? VirtualBox. Virtual Are you using that at a, in a server-side capacity? <laughs> yes. And what are the key advantages of VirtualBox? <laughs> there was a joke? I didn't hear it. HDVM on Itanium. Itanium, yes sir. Okay, Corey's out of here. So, okay, contact me separately about questions, requests, ideas. Uh, I invite you to BeehiveCon. I've, I am honored to close the first day of Meet BSD. I'll see you bright, bright, bright early tomorrow morning. And let's go have dinner. <laughs>